Let's move along here and take a look at the second portion of our Module 2 lectures that's related to pavement structures and bases, again for our course CET 208, Concrete and Asphalt Materials. The topics to be covered under this Module 2 lecture related to pavement structures and bases are going to be the pavement structure itself. We're going to take a look at the thickness design. We're going to look at the subgrade construction that we're going to have to hold up our pavement structure. The granular base and sub-base courses that are going to make up our subgrade construction. We're going to look at stabilized base and surface courses. Geosynthetics. We're going to take a look at the strategic highway research program. We're going to do inspection and quality control. And of course, we're going to look at test procedures. Let's move along here and take a look at the pavement structure itself. And the pavement structure is usually a surface or surface with asphalt or concrete mixes for the durability or durability reasons over the life cycle of the roadway surface. And also, we got to deal with the environmental conditions that are coming into play as the roadway system, highway system ages over time. Preparation for surfacing these roadways uh, involves construction of subgrades and a base course for the roadway stability. And we want to make sure that, again, we're going to be removing soils that are questionable in the area so we get a good supporting base. And of course, the base that we're going to put down uh, here in the Northeast, New Jersey, a lot of times you'll hear the word R blend. And our blend is brought in, usually recycled uh, concrete that's been ground up, and it compacts very well, solid, and creates a good base course for our other materials to go on top of. And the design of these components depends on the material to be used. Of course, hey, am I using a flexible surface or am I using a concrete surface? and the conditions that the pavement surface must meet through changing, again, as I mentioned, environmental conditions. As we know, these environmental conditions are going to change as we go throughout the United States. Down in Florida, we're going to see a lot of rains, water type of activity. The northeast where I'm at, we're going to get rain, we're going to get snow, we're going to get sleet, hail. Uh, have to deal with uh, hurricane conditions, flooding conditions, things like this. We get out to the Colorado area, of course, in that mountain range, we're going to start getting into that snow, sleet, hail, and environmental issues and weather conditions like these. And the main function of the pavement system and structure is to distribute the wheel loads over larger areas of the underlying natural soils. So as we put down our base and our sub base and our top layer we're looking to create a wider area so that our wheelbase and as we know vehicles we can have a small compact car can have a smaller wheelbase than a tractor trailer so we want to be able to distribute these loads over the area as the vehicle travels down the same roadway if we continue to look at the pavement structure that we have to create, as we all know, if the vehicle travels on soil itself, its sheer failures would result within the wheel path and travel would be difficult to achieve. And I think many of us have seen this in old movies or highlights or anything along these lines where the old Model T's are traveling around the country. There's really no road surface to travel on. And we see them trying to go down roadways with ruts in the road created by the wheel spacing that we have. So we want to try and eliminate this so we don't have this sheer failure of the soils. The sheer strength of the soil is not high enough to support the flow of the traffic over long sustained time periods and through changing environmental conditions. So again, soils are there but as we travel over them back and forth and we also have to remember that a lot of our old road or road systems were actually wagon train paths at uh, horse and buggy and uh, wagon trains along these lines would go down 
and these were later on soil conditions may be removed if needed and these surfaces were paved so even at those times we had that rutting effect because now we don't have the soil doesn't have the strength to hold up the load that's being imposed on it so we want to make sure that when we do our pavement structures we're creating that strong solid surface that the vehicular traffic can flow over without having any of this failure. So the function of the pavement design and surface is to create a level and safe uh, surface, again, for travel path and good line of sight. Now we always, always wanna make sure we have good line of sight because if we're traveling down a roadway and we're gonna make a curve or head into a curve, we want to be able to see around that curve. We want to see what's coming at us as well as our vehicle going around that the other vehicle can see us. So we want that line of sight. And we have to remember that pavements are classified as rigid or flexible. So these are the things we look at when we talk about pavement surfaces. With a rigid and flexible pavement system. We have rigid pavement consists of concrete surfaces. And we used to see that a lot during the depression era when bridges were made, uh, roadways were concreted and things like that. Of course, the concrete surfaces act as a beam and distribute the wheel loads uh, fairly uniformly over the area of that slab. And we also have reinforcement that goes in there. So that reinforcement, as in any type of concrete slab, we're going to put some rebar in there, some wire mesh possibly, depending on what the design specifications call for. And then we're going to support that even more so that, again, the loading that goes over it through our truck and car traffic is distributed over the whole concrete slab or beam, and it will withhold or withstand that loading imposed on it. Flexible pavement are made up of an asphalt concrete, and these are stabilized or bound granular materials that we have already discussed earlier in our other lectures that we looked at. And these distribute the load over a cone-shaped area under the wheel, and this is because they're flexible. The loading is more uh, imposed right there as the wheel goes along and the distribution is kind of right there it goes into a cone shape and we'll take a look at that in a minute so this helps reduce the imposed unit stresses as the depth increases so we want to take a look at that in a minute and the overall rate of the stress reduction varies with the properties of the layers which makes it difficult to estimate and again that's why we're doing our soil investigations compaction and things along these lines as we start to design a roadway system. Again, we want to make sure the underlying soils are going to be able to hold up our structure and withstand the loads that are imposed on them. So for example, a 45 degree cone would require a tire pressure of 90 PSI that can be reduced to 4 PSI at the depth of 16 inches. Let's take a look at the load distribution of pavement surfaces with our two illustrations here. To the left, we have a rigid pavement structure. To the right, we have a flexible pavement structure. So as we can see, we have a 3,000 kilogram tire weight coming down on the surface of our concrete material. So the left side is a concrete slab. And as we can see underneath, we have this purplish distribution factor of how it starts to spread it out. And of course, the pressure is less than 0.2 megapascals. If we move to the right surface, now we have a flexible pavement structure, same 3,000 kilogram tire. And as we can see, we get this cone effect that's pushing down into the layers. And again, the pressure equals 2 megapascals. Here's examples of the same two situations we just looked at this time rigid again flexible pavement off to the left we can see that concrete slab and we can see how the metal rebar is coming out of it which is going to support that more off to our right again it's a flexible pavement it's an asphalt concrete material and it's going to give us that cone effect as tire pressures or tires run over it and it goes 
and gets distributed down to the soil conditions that we have. If we continue to look at this or these pavement structures, the major components of a pavement structure consist of the following. We have a surface material, whether it's flexible asphalt or flexible asphalt concrete or just concrete. We have a base that goes under this surface because we want to make sure that we're supporting the upper layer. We have a sub-base material, as I mentioned, something that's going to be granular. Uh, a lot of times, again, you'll hear R blend. The major components of the subgrade structure also consist of, we look at compacted subgrade materials. We want to make sure, again, if it's R blend, um, that actually hardens like concrete. It is concrete, but when that gets really compacted together, it's a good sub base to have underneath a road surface. We get the natural subgrade. Of course, we're going to cut down depending on what the specifications ask for or are required. Going to be so much of a sub base grade on top of the natural subgrade that we have. Again, specifications are going to tell us what that has to be. Bases and sub bases are usually granular materials or aggregate. So again, cheap way out, we use our blend. It's going to save us some money. It's recycled concrete material. Sub bases uh, does require a high quality of material due to its location within the lower portion of the supporting structure. So again, whatever we're going to use, want to make sure it's going to be nice, sturdy, solid. And our blend again works wonders. You put that down and wet it a little bit. It basically turns into concrete. And our compacted subgrade may consist of layers of a subgrade compacted in cut areas or embankment materials in fill zones. So again, this is going to be specced out by the design professional that's going to require what they want in the materials that they have. If we continue to look at a pavement structure or our pavement structure, the main function of the pavement structure is to reduce the high unit stresses imposed by vehicles, again, whether they're compact, mid-sized, tractor trailers, on the surface to stresses on the subgrade that are low enough to be carried without failure due to. And we have situations like rutting, uh, excessive settlement, or other types of distress that could play a role in the fatigue factor on our surface material. And the magnitude of the stress reduction is mainly a function of the thickness of the pavement structure or layer or layers that we have. And of course, this would then be the main variable in design process or the design process of a highway and road surfaces, the pavement thickness. So what we're trying to do is take the load that's on the upper surface layer and just transpose that or transport it right down through our so uh, soils and our other materials that we have. So we got our surface layer, we got our base, our subgrade. We got nice sandy soils because we did a soil investigation, found out what we had to remove. We compacted it the correct way. So now when that load goes on it, we're trying to reduce or eliminate rutting, settlement, or any other types of distress that are going to cause a failure to our road surface in general. Let's take a look at some factors involved in the design of pavement thickness. And of course, we want to look at the magnitude of the imposed load that we're trying to support. Of course, we want to look at the strength of the subgrade soil. We're going to learn that from our soil investigations that we completed. And a typical uh, city design parameters might be as follows. And again, it's our engineers, design professionals, state, Department of uh, Transportation or Department of Transportation individuals who establish these based on the region of the country we live in or areas, what's the environmental conditions we're going to affect this area and so on. So if we look at, uh, we may have uh, arterial roads here. We may have a three inch asphalt concrete surface. We may have a six inch granular base. And then of course we may have a 12 inch granular sub base that we're going to use to build up our road surface from the natural soils to the surface layer. Local roads, we may have an inch and a half. Um, asphalt concrete, we may have 
against six inches of granular base, six inches of granular sub base. And if we get into rural roads, we might be looking at about six inches for the granular base with an asphalt seal coat and another six inch for the granular base that we have. So if we continue to look at these major factors that are involved in design of pavement thicknesses, of course, it's important to remember that many individuals who are involved with the task of creating these design, uh, design specification for these pavement structures base these design parameters or situations on their own past ex uh, experiences related to the pavement surfaces and their abilities to perform adequately over time and through different changing environmental conditions. So a lot of this is history. What do we know about this situation in a certain area? Alaska, let's say, Minnesota, Florida, Arizona. You know, we have different environmental situations here that we're going to have to deal with. So when we deal with these, we got to bring those parameters into our design criteria factors. Also, we have to remember that example design conditions are based on what might be required and actual design specification standards vary, again, considerably based on the aggregate materials that are available in the general location of the project. Because if we have to start hauling in materials, it's going to get very expensive. So we're going to look to see what do we have in the local area that we can utilize and our design parameters are going to be based on those aggregate materials that we can get our hands on. Of course, another consideration with the design process is the required maintenance needed to provide a safe road surface and possible failure that might occur through these same local road pavement surfaces that we are installing. So again, are we going to have a lot of salt, sand, plowing? What's taking place on these road surfaces that we're going to probably have to deal with? And again, we got to think ahead and try to get those into our design parameters so that we know we can have this road surface last for years. And if we take a look at the, again, two images here, we get the pavement structure sections. Off to the left, we have our flexible pavement. Off to the right, rigid pavement. So with our flexible pavement, we get the layer of asphalt. And then we come down to the layer of sand, gravel, or crushed stone that we're going to use. And of course, we have that natural formation that we're going to put our whole subsurface and surface materials on. So our surface, our base, and our sub base. So if we look at the rigid side, we've got some concrete, of course, or the layer of concrete. In there, we've got some rebar, steel metal rods that uh, gonna hold, or hold that whole surface together. And again, we're going to have the layer of sand, gravel, or crushed stone, and our natural formation of the soil conditions that we have. So let's take a look at the design load measurements for pavement structures. And of course, the measurement of the design load for a pavement structure road surface can be very difficult to accomplish based on the unknowns and variables associated, of course, with the following. One of them is going to be the wheel loads, which vary from light passenger to large transport vehicles. Again, we mentioned it, or I mentioned it may have uh, compact vehicles. We could have tractor trailers. There's all kinds of factors that are going to come in here. So we don't know what really is going to affect this road surface. We need to adjust or handle how we're going to handle this loading as we look at the overall surface materials. The load application vary, of course, from a few thousand to many millions per year. So again, what do we have? Is it a road? Maybe when it first goes in, it's not used that much. But over the course of 10, 20 years, now it becomes a major roadway that many people are using shortcut or just to travel from, again, as we always do, point A to point B. Of course, the growth in the amount of type of traffic can only be estimated for the design life cycle of the pavement material. If we look at our infrastructure or road infrastructure system, we may have a lot of land area when we first put this road in. 
now all of a sudden that land area starts to get developed and we have residential structures on it multi-family structures small uh, retail stores maybe even a mall now all of a sudden that road surface is going to have a lot more load on it than it did when it was first designed of course the decrease in serviceability due to age the climate and the type of traffic must be taken into account and we again see this a lot of times after a while we'll see the milling machines come in and road surfaces being repaved so that we can extend the life cycle or the life of that over the next generations of people that are going to use that road surface so we have methods to estimate the pavement design loads now are these always a hundred percent correct no but we have something that we can fall back on that allows us to do some sort of estimate on the design loads that we have. So the various methods uh, or various methods have been developed by highway authorities in order to estimate the loads imposed on a pavement design and a surface. And again, this is over time. History, as we've been designing roads, uh, allows us to take a lot of this into consideration through the learning curve of designing roads so the methods are as follows we get the AADT which is the average annual daily traffic that we're going to see we then get the DTN which is the design traffic number we then get the EWL the equivalent wheel loads that are going to be on our surface we get the ESAL, which is a total number of equivalent. We get 18 kips or 18,000 pounds or 80 kilonewtons for a single axle loads expected on the pavement for the design period that we have basically calculated it for. And of course, the ESAL method was developed by the AS. SHTO in the late 1950s and was upgraded in 1993 to meet the new design conditions that we have and if you think about it 1950 second world war is done baby boomers are moving in or coming out of the cities into the rural areas populating these areas so of course a lot of design parameters have changed over that 43 year period and they now have to be taken into consideration when we look at designing new roads. So if we take a look at the guide now for the AASHTO, the guide contains tables to allow individuals to calculate the ESAL values for axle loads of 2 to 50 kips. And it also allows for other variables to be considered while we're looking at this calculation and guide and the variables consist of a number of axles or types of axles the strength and type of the pavement traffic in the design lane for multi-lane highways and an estimated traffic growth over the design period of the road and really the key is that traffic growth how much are we going to start to move we can get a pretty good idea type of axle it's a dual axle single axle the strength and type of the pavement again that becomes a design uh, criteria parameter traffic and design lane for multi-lane highways again we can start to figure that out but again that traffic growth over the design period really becomes the big variable that we're going to have so if we take a look at the subgrade now we want to look at the effective strength of the subgrade soil again we looked at the module one there we talked about the soil investigations how important they are to get in there and get these soil samples get down to the sub layers let's find out what's under there so now we get a better supporting structure for our road surface so the soil strength will vary greatly along the road route and I mentioned that before any type of area that we're going to have as a project soils can change as we go from different areas within that same project and of course the designs can be changed continuously along the route due to the cost and construction problems 
again this is where we're back to soil investigations are we removing soils are we bringing soils in things along these lines play a major role in the cost climate factors also play a role in the strength assessments as i mentioned uh, in the soil investigations we got uh, permafrost up in alaska got to deal with it minnesota it's cold got to deal with it so we get down into arizona and some of the hotter climates now we've got some different environmental issues that we're going to look at and deal with the subgrade strength varies greatly again between winter and spring get these seasonal changes in temperatures of course changes the way the soils act and our subgrade strength will act estimated soil strength calculation so when we do that we want to look here and we get the group index or GI indication of the silt and clay content of the soils. So in order to calculate that group index, we're looking at F minus 35 times the value, of course, of 0 0.2 plus 0, 0 0.5 times the WL minus the 40. And then we add that to 0 0.1 F minus 15 and our IP minus 10. Of course, F stands for the percentage passing through the zero, uh, sorry, 0 0.075 millimeter sieve. The WL is the numerical liquid limit expressed as a whole number. We know IP, the numerical plasticity index expressed as a whole number. And of course, one of the things we want to note here is the group index is usually calculated as part of the AA SHTO soil classification system for A-2-6 and A-2-7 soils, use only the second term, including the plasticity. We're going to move on here and take a look or discuss the uh, California burning ratio or the CBR. This was originally developed by the California Division of Highways, of course, makes sense. California bearing ratio. It's the most common strength test conducted on soils for evaluation of the subgrade quality that we're dealing with. The compacting or compacting a sample at its optimum moisture content. We talked about this before in compaction. And applying a surcharge to the sample to represent the estimated thickness of the pavement over the subgrades that we have. And of course, we're going to be soaking the samples for four days during this test. And we're going to be forcing a 19.4 square centimeter plunger into the sample to a depth of 2.5 millimeters. The force required to obtain this penetration expresses a percent of the standard load for the crushed road base material that we're going to be using or have on that site. So if we continue to look at the CBR, the resilient modulus or the M sub R, this test samples are taken or test samples, I should say, are taken from soil sampling tubes or remolded in 71 millimeter diameter molds at a density and moisture values representative of the field conditions that we have at the site. They are then tested or tested in a modified triaxial cell the axle load is applied for 0.1 seconds and removed for 0.9 seconds. This process is repeated 100 times. And of course, the information or data we collect and the resilient modulus where the M sub R is imposed, repeated axle stress divided by the resilient axle strain and of course we get this MR equals this value. So we get this value as we know. If we take a look at the AA SHTO guide, it uses the resilient modulus M sub R in PSI units for the measurement of the subgrade strength that we're dealing with. 
The guide includes tables to allow the determination of an effective value using monthly values that can vary from 20,000 PSI in February to 2,500 PSI in March, depending on the area that might be subjected to freezing and thawing conditions. And again, you can see these tables in the PowerPoint presentations that are within the module. If the resilient modulus test results are not available, the guide allows the M sub R values to be calculated from the results of the California bearing ratio. And the R test results are calculated as follows. So we get a little different here, modification. So the resilient modulus, it's gonna be in PSIs. We're gonna get 1500 times the California bearing ratio for fine grain soils with a soaked California bearing ratio of 10 or less. We can also look at, again, the resilient modulus, again in PSI. This time it's 1,000 plus to 5,500 times the R value. And this is for fine grain soils with R values up to 20. Let's take a look at what the Asphalt Institute recommends or the recommendations are. So the Asphalt Institute recommends the following approximate relationships in their design method if the resilient modulus values are not available. So they're looking at the resilient modulus, but this time it's in megapascals. It's gonna equal 10.3 times the California burring ratio value that we have. Or we're gonna have a resilient modulus, again, megapascals. This time it's gonna equal 0.8 plus 3.8 times the R value that we have. Let's take a look at the thickness design. And of course, a number of methods have been developed for the design thickness of the various layers of sub or surface materials used for the flexible pavement structure. Of course, we have design charts and these are all within the presentations in the module itself. So make sure you take a look at this when you go through it. But design charts are available for using data from soil quality determination tests and traffic loading to estimate required thickness or thicknesses of different types of pavement construction. So again, our soil investigation is going to give us a lot of this information. And of course, the following are charts that can be used in order to determine pavement thickness or thicknesses for road surface designs. Let's take a look at the California Burring ratio design chart. So here we have off to the left, it's going to be the depth of construction in centimeters of the layer in question. Along the top, we get the California burring ratio percentage. Now we have to look at the information here. It's going to help us use these lines to determine what we need to do. So if I have a traffic classification here, and of course I've got line A, B, C, D, E, F, G, of course the number of commercial vehicles per day exceeding the four tons and we have the number and then we start to work from there and use the chart now please keep in mind there's an example in the presentations in the module for two that you can follow on how to use this chart if we move on and take a look at the asphalt institute design guide well now again we're looking at the subgrade resilient modulus psi we looked at how we're going to calculate that. And of course, we're looking at the lower part, the equivalent 18,000 pound single axle loads or the ESAL that we have. And we have values here that we're going to start to use this chart to kind of determine what we need to do when designing that surface. Let's take a look at the soil support value S for the AA SHTO design method. As we can see here on the left side, we have the soil or S soil support value. We get the R value, California. We get the R value for Washington. And we're moving to the right here, of course. We get the California bearing ratio for Kentucky. We get the Texas triaxle class. We get the group index. And of course, we move across to the far right and get the modulus or the M sub R value in PSIs. In this particular table, we've got some suggested values for the strength coefficients that we would be using. 
and of course it's the surface uh, course A1 and then we got a road mix we get uh, a plant mix we get a sand asphalt we get a base course A sub 2 here and of course we're going to get a sandy gravel a crushed stone we get a cement treated uh, no soil cement compressive strength at seven days and so on and as we look down or move down the table we have different values all the way down to sandy or sandy clay that we would look at for these strength coefficients if we go back and take a look at the AA SHTO revised method and as it stated earlier in 1993 the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials made some changes that included the following. The subgrade soil strength is measured by the resilient modulus. The variation of the modulus during the year is determined and used in calculating the effective resilient modulus. Coefficients for various types of surfaces, bases, and sub-bases are calculated from the results of tests for elastic modulus for these materials. The formula for the structural number, of course, was modified and it was done as follows. So we looked at SN is going to be A1 times D1 plus A2 D2 M2 plus A3 D3 and M3. M2 and M3 were modified factors or modifying factors varying in the value between 0 0.40 and 1.4, depending on the drainage characteristics of the pavement structure that we have. Other factors allow design to take into account reliability, serviceability, and standard deviations. So we already looked at how we can determine the values of A1 and A2. So how are we going to use the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials Guide. And we can do it in the following method. So we're going to look at the design chart mean values that are used for input or each input to the chart to obtain a value for the design structural number SN. And we're going to do it as follows. The reliability percentage. Of course, we know many factors are considered and involved when evaluating the reliability of the pavement to provide satisfactory service for the design period of the road surface. Again, environmental conditions, location, things like that are going to come into play. So suggested levels vary from 85 to 99.9% .9 freeway in urban areas. We get 80 to 99.9% .9 freeway in rural areas. We get 50 to 80% for all local roads and collectors are rated at 80 to 90 percent urban, 75 to 95 percent rural roads, and we're going to look at the overall standard deviation. The factors account for chance variations in traffic predictions and normal variations in pavement performance. So we're going to try and do the best we can, but we're going to look at some variations that could take place again, traffic predictions, pavement performance. And the AASHTO uses 0.25 for rigid and 0.35 for flexible pavement surfaces. If we continue to look at the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials guide, we're going to estimate the total 1800 kip equivalent load application or W equals or W sub 18. So we're based on an ESAL for the design period reduced to give the value for the design lane that we have. So the following chart provides the information that we need. So we get the effective roadbed soil resilient modulus or the subgrade soil support value of M sub R. Values for M sub R are listed for each month and take into account seasonal variations. Again, this information is in the PowerPoint presentations that are within the module two course learning objectives. So the average demand factor gives the effective resilient modulus for the pavement design. And in the following figures, which we'll take a look at in a second, 
the values for M sub R are listed for each month or half month with the corresponding relative damage factor indicated. And again, this information is also within the PowerPoint presentations for this module. And the sum of the drainage factors for a year is determined and the average is found by dividing the total by 12, of course, 12 months for monthly calculations and by 24 for half month calculations. And of course, we want to review the, the charts for the resilient modules information that we're going to need to determine these calculations. And again, you're going to find those charts and tables within the PowerPoint presentations. So please make sure you take a look at those, go back in, go through those. There's examples on how to solve the calculations and everything that you're going to need to work through the problems for this module's assignment submissions. So let's move on. We're going to take a look at the reduction for more than one lane in each direction. So our table here gives us the number of lanes in each direction and the percentage of the ESAL for one direction in the design lane. So how many lanes do I have? Two, three, four. I move across. What's my percentage here or percentage for the ESAL? So if I have two lanes, it's 80 to 100 percent, three lanes, 60 to 80. And if I have four lanes, I'm moving from 50 to 75 percent. Let's take a look at the design serviceability law, so the change in the PSI. And the design serviceability loss is the serviceability is defined as the ability of the pavement to serve the traffic. So we've got to be able to withstand that loading on it, and we want to be able to serve the traffic flow that goes over it. Rated at zero for an impossible road to five for a perfect road. After the SN is located, the depth of the various layers can be determined using the following relationship. So again, we look at the SN, A sub 1, D sub 1, plus A sub 2 times D sub 2 times M sub 2, plus A sub 3, again, D sub 3, M sub 3. Where again, A, 1, 2, and 3 are layer coefficients for the surface, the base, and the sub-base courses that we have. This information, again, can be found within the PowerPoint notes or lectures that we have built within the course. D1, D2, D3 are the thicknesses and in inches for the respective courses that we have. The drainage coefficients are M2 and M3 for the base and sub-base. The layer coefficients depend on the strength and quality of the courses of the material that we're using. Again, mentioned it earlier, what do we have available within the general area that we're going to use? Let's continue to look at design serviceability loss. And the test for resilient or the resilient modulus are recommended but can be estimated from the following two tables. And these tables are going to be found in the lecture presentations within the module two learning objectives. So the AA SHTO uses a value of 4.2 for flexible pavements and 4.5 for rigid pavements. The value for the surface course varies from 0.2 for an elastic modulus of 100,000 PSI to 0.44 for 450,000 PSI. The value of high stability mixes is 0.44 and is normally used when no other information is available. Kind of makes sense. And the first figure shows the estimated value for the A2 for the base. Again, this is in the course materials in the PowerPoint presentations of the Module 2 Learning Objectives. And our second figure shows the estimated values for the A3 or for the sub-base that we have. Let's take a look at our subgrade construction. And we're mainly looking at two factors here. The first one is the compaction of the top layer and cuts and the whole depth of the material and fills for the embankments. And our second factor is the identification and treatment of unsuitable materials. And we talked about this during the soil investigations and compaction lectures. 
it's very important that we identify these sub layers so that if we need to remove this material because it's unstable it's going to affect our road surface we need to do that right away unsuitable or borderline material include organic and other compressed soils along with other areas or areas subjected to freezing temperatures and frost susceptible soils topsoil is the top layer of most existing soils and it has a high organic content and it is quite compressible so again we need to address this because if we don't we're going to create an unstable situation in our road stability and surface Topsoil is usually removed in fill areas. It is located within three meters or so of the final subgrade surface and treatment may include one of the following. So we've got some options on how we could possibly handle this topsoil layer. We can get a floating or floating the pavement, get excavation and replacement of the organic material, displacement of the organic deposit using surcharge, and we could use or have the use of ge geotextiles to separate base materials from the subgrade and to reinforce the subgrade strength that we have. Let's take a look at the frost damage that could occur. And we want to definitely address this as soon as possible. So the low class roads damage occurs in susceptible soils due to the capillary rise in soils. As water rises in capillary tubes above the water table, inversely with the average size of the pores in the soil structure. So again, we were talking about that, these void areas, and we want to make sure we're um, you know, addressing this so that we can have or take this concern, hopefully away from our roadway design. So as freezing occurs, water in the larger pores freezes. However, the capillary water in adjacent smaller pores does not freeze. So it creates this problem for us with some frost damage. This is due to the depression in the freezing temperature in these very small volumes of water that we have. Supercooled water moves to the previously formed ice crystals and freezes on the crystal. Ice lens may grow two to four inches. As freezing front penetrates further, more ice lenses are formed. This causes heaving in the road surface that can be as large as one foot. And that's where this water freezes and starts to build up that it actually lifts the road from underneath. And of course we get roadway damage. If we continue to look at the frost damage, during this thawing of the heaved soil pavement breakup may occur and the frost boils or wet potholes are formed on the surface as the roadbed thaws due to excessive water and loose conditions of the roadbed. In order for frost damage occurs, we have to have freezing temperatures, a water source, and frost susceptible soils. Now, please keep in mind, this is a little bit different than plows running through and digging up the road surface. So what happens during the cycles of the freeze and thaw? Of course, damage can increase during the cycles of the freeze thaw process. The source of free water is groundwater. And susceptible soils have a fairly high capillary rise and is permeable enough to allow water to transport through the layers. And this could include silts, silty clays, very fine sands, sands and gravels with silt or fine clays. So let's take a look at some techniques that we can do or employ to control frost damage. Removal and replacement of frost susceptible materials within all or part of the zone of the frost penetration. Again, that going to come from our soil investigation reports, determine what we need to remove. Insulation of the susceptible soil with rigid foam sheets to reduce the depth of the frost penetration. Deepening of the ditches or provisions of sub drains to lower the water table. Construction of capillary cutoff layers made up of coarse sands or waterproof sheets below the susceptible soil. Construction of a thicker, stronger pavement structure over susceptible soils or, of course, 
questionable soils. Let's move along here and take a look at our subgrades and our rigid pavement. And one of the things we had to keep in mind that with rigid pavements may require additional control measures. The subgrade uh, should provide uniform support for the rigid pavement. May be necessary to mix the type of soil found along the route. And again, our route could be hundreds of miles. Should have concerns about the subgrade for rigid pavements are related to frost heaving, expansive soils, and mud pumping. So in that case, let's take a look at expansive soils and rigid pavement. And with expansive soils, it may cause swelling and shrinking of the subgrade, resulting in distortions of the pavement surface. And soils classified as A-6 or A-7 on the AASHTO classification chart for MH, CH, or OH, according to the Unified System, are now types of expansive soils that we would be looking to address. And in order to avoid problems, compaction must be done at 2% above the optimum value and swelling is controlled and soils do not absorb much more water. So again, our soil investigation reports come in as a big key here. Mud pumping is the displacement of fine soil particles and water through cracks, joints, and the edges of the pavement due to heavy axle loads. And this can lead to uneven support under uh, the slabs that we have and to control the problem, a layer of a very permeable granular subbase may be required that has low plasticity and is not over 15% passing through the number 200 sieve. And if we look at our granular basin sub-base course, the base course is composed solely of granular materials like aggregates or soils or granular materials stabilized by an additive. The flexible payment must help to distribute the load and be strong enough to carry the load without shear failure and of course resultant rutting. It must allow water to drain and if water is not allowed to drain the water will fill the pores and reduce the frictional support of the particles within the sub-base material. And it must be able to resist frost and it must also prevent infiltration of the subgrade materials that we would have. Let's continue to look at the granular base and sub-base course. Sub-bases for flexible pavement must drain easily in order to prevent frost action or heaving conditions to occur and the strength is not as important due to the fact that the sub-bases are lower in the pavement structure and are subjected to smaller loads being imposed on them. The granular base or a singular granular course is required for rigid pavement and is usually called, of course, the sub-base. The main function is to prevent pavement pumping, which is created by shallow voids under the slab due to either a slight slab def uh, deflection with each load or to curling of the slab caused by temperature variations between the top and bottom layers of the slab. It can also be caused by water filling the void space due to the infiltration of rain or other causes or by the mixing of water and fines in the underlying material. Of course, the ejection of this material at joints and edges of the pavement are caused by the wheel load and the slab deflections that occur. If we continue to look at our granular base and sub-base courses, rigid pavement, large voids have been created under the slabs by pumping and the sub-base should be designed, of course, to prevent this pumping. In order to control pumping, it is recommended that the sub-base have or have a less than 45% passing a number 200 sieve. Of course, it should have a maximum plasticity index of six and in heavy traffic or load areas with 700 heavy axle loads per day, the sub-base should contain not over 15% passing a 200 or number 200 sieve with a plasticity index and liquid limit of six and 25.
If we continue to look at our granular base and sub base course, the flexible pavement bases, their dense graded or densely graded materials, fall within limits results in a curve of roughly maximum density. Flexible pavement sub bases, grading requirements are more open. Percent of fines is restricted to a low maximum. The maximum values for plasticity to control the amount of clay spines that we have in the soil materials. Maximum loss and abrasion test to ensure hard aggregate. Maximum loss in the soundness test to prevent degradation due to cycle of freezing and thawing. Petrographic requirement to govern overall aggregate quality that we have. Drainage issues. So with any type of roadway design, we have to look at the drainage issues that may happen or occur. More attention is being focused on drainage these days. Granular bases can create drainage issues with fines having poor drainage. Over time, degradation of the base course occurs, which reduces the permeability rate of the soil materials. Some fines are required to provide a dense stable base during construction and stable base course is required during the service as well. What are some of the drainage problems that we could face with our roadway design? Water enters the base through cracks and joints in the surface layers allowing infiltration from the groundwater. Bases that become saturated lose a portion of their load carrying capacity and excess water in the sub base increases with the frost damage that we could have. With this in mind, this concludes our module two lecture on pavement structures and bases. Again, as I've mentioned before, please make sure you look at the PowerPoint presentations for example problems that are solved, which will assist you in solving the homework problems for submission.